Well, thank you very much. I'm really uh, honored to be here. Um, it's such a, a fantastic turnout uh, for what I think is, a, is really a great program, even though modesty forbids me from saying too much about how great it is. Uh, I want to start by showing a video uh, which will sort of set the concern that I want to discuss for about the next 40, 45 minutes. Um, obviously, you know, I think this is uh, really important, and I, I, think, I think the reason why Julia Gillard at the moment isn't um, just allowing us to have gay marriage is because she doesn't think it's really a priority. I'm not sure, because she's never given us an answer. A lot of people say it's because she's bowing down to Christian lobbies, but I, I'm not that cynical. I think she just doesn't think it's a priority. So um, I think this is an important opportunity for somebody to uh, really personalise the issue and make her understand all the kinds of uh, sensitive parts of the issue that people, people don't understand, which is, you know, kind of how a big a problem homophobia is for young people in, in our country, do you know what I mean? Um, I was talking to my boyfriend, my boyfriend would be at this dinner thing, and if I was with her, I would get him to tell the story that broke my heart about when he was 12 and he was getting, like, bullied on school camp at the beach and he just ran into the ocean and, and tried to drown himself. Or I would tell her about some... Um, you know, I used to do stand-up about being bullied in school, being kind of called Dancing Fag or Fairy Boy, and I didn't mention in that stand-up, you know, the time that three guys came up to me at a party and just kicked me in the head while yelling, faggot, you know where you stand. Do you know what I mean? Um, I don't know why I keep saying, do you know what I mean? I think you understand what I mean. Um, <laughs> but this is... And, and, Josh, if she said to you, the community's not ready for it, what would you say? Well, I would, I would say to her, they, they are. I mean, the polling shows they are. This is actually not a controversial issue. 63% of people want to see this. 74% of Labour voters want to see this. At the moment in this country, uh, you have, if you're gay, you are at a much higher risk of... of uh, you will experience self... You're much higher... Much more likely to experience self-harm, depression, homelessness, eating disorders, drug abuse. You're five to 14 times more likely to attempt suicide. And, and the biggest contributing factor to that is homophobia. And the Marriage Act, as it stands, it empowers homophobia. And it needs to change, I think. Yeah. Summer. I'm actually very moved by that. I think that's actually quite powerful. Uh, there we have a guy who really is pouring out his heart and pointing out some pretty horrible things that have happened to him, that have happened to friends of his. And for him, in his mind, the ultimate cause of this is what he calls homophobia. And he sees the former, now, federal marriage laws in Australia as kind of a symbol of homophobia. You know, the same-sex marriage debate and a lot of what's going on today with transgenderism, it really signifies a tremendous shift that has taken place over the last 50 years uh, in terms of how we think about Christianity. Um, in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries, you had very strong critics of Christianity. And their great critique tended to be that, well, Christianity is irrational. Only an idiot would believe it. It's not scientific. As some of them also went on to say that there are some moral problems with Christianity as well, namely the idea of an everlasting hell. That's morally indefensible. That's, those ideas tended to be where critics of Christianity focused. But certainly what we've seen, uh, because of cultural shifts over the last 40, 50 years that I'll talk about, and certainly over the last 10 years, and I think what we're going to see for the next generation or two, is that the major critique of Christianity is not so much going to be that Christianity is irrational. It will be that Christianity is positively harmful. That, pos that Christianity is a positively harmful to people's mental health. That is the shift that we're seeing happening right now, and that is the argument that Christians, that clergy, that the churches need really to start thinking hard about. And I suppose what I want to do today is, I guess, think really hard about it, but out loud. Now, this notion of harm, there's a kind of common sense notion out there that I think probably most of us would kind of go along with. I go along with it myself. And it's this idea 
that the government should really only be able to interfere in our actions, interfere in our speech, if what we are doing is harming others. Now, that's called the harm principle, very famously stated by John Stuart Mill in a book he wrote called On Liberty uh, that was published in 1859. So it's an old principle. That actually goes well back before John Stuart Mill. You might even call it a kind of article of common sense in any liberal democracy that loves freedom, that the, the state should really only be able to interfere in our actions or punish us or stop us from doing things or force us to do things that otherwise we wouldn't do if it is preventing harm. I'm sympathetic with that idea. But here's the thing. When you think of harm quite narrowly as things that we might do to one another directly that are harmful, throwing sticks and stones, for example, then in actual fact the harm principle becomes quite a liberty-enhancing principle. That is, well, if you think of harm as basically don't rob one another, don't hit one another, uh, don't libel one another and, or slander one another and therefore affect their businesses or set back their, their uh, interests, then most of the things that we say and most of the things that we do actually turn out to be not harmful, which means that the government isn't really intervening in what you say and what you do all that much. But what if you start thinking about harm much more broadly? What if you start focusing not just on the sticks and the stones, but on the words? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. If there's one thing that we've really started to reject over the last 30 years, it's the idea that words do not hurt. And there's a strong, there's, there is a sense in which words do actually hurt. Of course they do. But once you get the government involved in that, then things can turn out uh, quite undesirable if you're committed to ideals of liberal democracy, freedom of speech, and freedom of religion. You see, what if you believe, or you can make a good case to the effect, that the words that we use can actually make some people feel really bad about themselves to the extent that their self-esteem suffers, and because their self-esteem suffers, they start to do all sorts of things that are actually really bad, like self-harming or experimenting with addictive substances. In that case, what we have is what we're broadening, broadening out what we consider to be harmful activity and harmful words. And in actual fact, you can say things, not even directly to someone's face, but just in a public forum, that actually turn out, according to the argument, to be quite harmful. If you expand harm from not just sticks and stones, but words that hurt people's feelings, and that might lead them to be excluded from groups, then something quite radical has happened. A quite, quite a radical shift has taken place. And the harm principle, the government should only intervene in order to prevent harm, goes from being a liberty-enhancing principle to a liberty-contracting, dare I say it even, liberty-destroying principle. And that is precisely what has been happening over the last 30 years. What has sort of emerged over the last 30 years and a bit further back is kind of what you might call the therapeutic state, the therapeutic state, where the state is increasingly, and corporations are part of this as well, where the state and corporations are not just seeing their jobs in terms of stopping people from robbing one another, in the case of the state, and also you know, pursuing profits for shareholders in the case of corporations, what has happened is that these institutions are starting to see themselves sort of as great therapists whose duty it is to make sure that people do not feel bad about themselves and in order to do that they feel that they have a right, even a duty, to stop certain ideas 
to silence certain speech, even to punish certain people who say things that don't make other people feel affirmed about themselves. How did this therapeutic state emerge? That's a good question. And that's a hard one to answer. And maybe it's because of shifting conceptions of what we consider the good life to be. So before World War II, in times of greater austerity and, and times where there isn't great plenty, the traditional idea of what it is to live a good life or to be having a good life is that you do your duty, that you are doing your duty. You are doing your duty as a father, you are doing your duty as a, as a mother, as a spouse, as a citizen. But after World War II, the Western world starts to become incredibly pro prosperous. And we start to live a lot better. And we start to focus more on ourselves as individuals. We become much more individualistic. And we start thinking of the good life less in terms of doing one's duty for others and more in terms of personal happiness. And more in terms of, because we've got so many more options available to us in life now, because of our prosperity, more in terms of realizing my true self. Who am I really? And the good life becomes the life where you have really lived your authentic self. And when you start defining the good life in terms of being happy and living according to, to, to who you really are, then you start thinking in terms of having a right to being happy. Surely I have a right to live the good life. And therefore, I have a right to be happy. I have a right to feel that my life really is an expression of who I really am, which means that anyone who says something that makes you unhappy or anyone who says something that makes you doubt your life choices or question your identity or feel bad about yourself, it is almost like they are violating your right to be happy. They're almost like kind of denying or destroying your rights. And what does a government exist to do if not to make sure that other people don't violate your rights? And so, boy, this, you know, this, this kind of cultural moment that we're all in really has a long history. And where has it led us? To this. You know, the Israel Falau case is just one case among dozens of this kind of thing. But it's so important to keep in mind, you know, what was the great accusation against Israel Folau? It was not that Izzy had offended people. When Raylene Castle ripped up that man's contract, it wasn't because he was offensive. Israel Folau's great crime was that his words are harmful, that he is creating mental health issues with his words. Indeed, that Israel Folau is actually causing people, young LGBTQ people, to kill themselves. It, sometimes it was almost stated as crudely as that, as though Izzy himself had blood on his hands. Boy, this just, this raises so many questions for the church today. And we see a really dangerous trend emerging because once you start saying that, well, certain words that we use and certain ideas that are out there are actually harmful in the sense that they're causing people to feel bad about themselves and then leading them to engage in acts of self-harm, even in suicide, then boy, does that give the state, does that give corporations open slather on regulating, censoring, banning words and on punishing people who utter these ideas that are so allegedly harmful. And all of that becomes completely consistent with that harm principle that I spoke about earlier, that the state should really only think about inter intervening in our actions and ideas if they can prove to be harmful. Man, does that become a dangerous idea 
once you start thinking of harm really broadly. Boy, is that a dangerous idea. I'm going to come to the question of the relationship between Christian ideas, Christianity, and bad mental health or harm in a second. But I really, I really want to focus on one aspect of this argument, and, and it's kind of the idea that's implicit in so many people who were speaking uh, during the same-sex marriage debate, arguing in favour of uh, changing the marriage laws, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's really explicit also in debates right now taking place in Australia and all around the liberal democratic world on the question of religious freedom. Um, and at the sort of the basis of all of this is kind of like, well, if freedom of religion and freedom of speech, or if certain religious ideas and certain things that we say can be implicated in harm, can be implicated in negative states of affairs in terms of people thinking really self-destructive thoughts and going on and doing self-destructive deeds, then we can ban those things. We can ban that kind of speech. We can limit religious freedom. I actually think that's wrong. It seems to me that if you actually believe that you can start getting rid of certain long-held rights because they can lead to harmful outcomes, that's kind of the end of liberal democracy as we know it. Because so, many, so much speech that we would consider to be valuable speech, whether it's political speech, whether it's religious speech, and so many other rights that we exercise, for example, freedom of association, unfortunately and tragically, can actually lead to harmful outcomes, which is not necessarily anyone's intention. So, for example, let's just say, in, in, let's imagine we're in a liberal democracy. I'd like to think that we are. I think we still are. But let's say that we were going to ban all speech that may be perpetuated gender stereotypes that turned out socially to be harmful in all kinds of ways. It made women feel bad about their bodies. It stopped them from really achieving what they could achieve academically and career-wise and things like that. What do you start banning? Well, you start banning Disney cartoons because of the stereotypes of women. You start banning Barbie dolls. You ban the Quran. Surah 434 is it exactly a foundational text for modern feminism. Uh, look it up if you're interested in that kind of thing. You would ban probably the Bible. Uh, what if you are a, what if you believe that, that the climate change is such a serious issue that if we don't act on it now, we're going to have catastrophic results? That's a very mainstream idea around today, sure. But wouldn't that then justify the state banning any speech that either questions climate change itself or suggests that actually the consequences of it aren't necessarily as bad as we all think and therefore we ought to all kind of take a chill pill, still deal with it, but not as a sort of catastrophic event? Wouldn't that justify banning all that kind of speech? Because what could be more harmful than speech that, that, pre, that starts to prevent us from acting in a way to, pre, to prevent a global catastrophe? What about stereotypes about men? Man is, you know, men being strong, men being resilient. Uh, doesn't this lead to a kind of toxic masculinity? Yeah, ban it. But what about other rights that we enjoy that, again, tragically can actually lead to harmful circumstances. Do you get rid of them? For example, freedom of association. Freedom of association means that you get to associate with whom you want, but it also means that you don't have to associate with anyone and everyone. There are certain people that you can actually choose not to be friends with. Now, you know, everyone here growing up probably had that feeling of being excluded at one point, excluded from a group, and that leads to feelings of self-doubt, it leads to loneliness. But do you therefore start regulating freedom of association? 
just to try to make sure that no one feels excluded? Does the government start coming in and saying, well, you know something, you have to be friends with her, you have to be friends with him, we've got to make sure no one feels excluded. What would a society look like where a government actively intervened in our personal freedom of association like that? Like, that would be an awful society to live in. The point that I'm making is, is that just because the exercise of certain rights can actually have detrimental effects on people indirectly, that is not a sufficient reason for the government to come in and start stopping the exercise of those rights. So even if you could prove that Christian doctrines and Christian ideas actually do have detrimental mental health effects on members of the LGBTQ community, that in itself is not a sufficient argument against religious freedom. You need a lot more than that. But here's the question. What is the relationship between... Christian ideas on sexuality and harmful states of affairs and mental health issues for the LGBTQ community. Well, we all know that in the media there is a lot of talk about, you know, suicide rates and depression among queer youth among queer people in general. When I use the word queer, that's really just an umbrella term um, for the LGBTQ, um, uh, um, I don't want to say alphabet, but um, that, that, particular, <laughs> that particular term. So I'll just say queer for, for brevity, if that's okay. Um, we're all aware of this. Now, you know, it also has to be pointed out that the links... Well, the, 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 the rates of suicide among queer people, they are contentious among scholars. That no one really knows exactly what the rates are. So we've got to be really careful about blanket claims that they're really, really high or they're disproportionately high. That may be the case, but there's still a lot more research that needs to be done on that. Let's assume, for argument's sake, that they are disproportionately high. I'm happy to assume that. Um, what is the cause of this? Now, when we listened to our, our friend Joshua Thomas on Q&A just earlier, for Joshua Thomas, the single biggest cause of all of this is homophobia. And, of course, that's why Christians and Christian ideas are looked down upon by so many queer rights advocates. But is it obvious that homophobia is the main cause of the mental health issues in the queer community? You see, if you really want to understand something, you want to understand exactly what's causing it. And if you really do care about the mental health of people in that community, you're going to really try hard to figure out what the causes are. Doesn't that make sense? And so what if there are a whole bunch of other things going on in the queer community that quite plausibly could be feeding into this mental health issue? For example, recently The Guardian, a left-wing newspaper, said that we need to have, or that the, the queer community needs to have a serious look at itself and look at the incredibly high rates of sexual abuse within that community among adults. That it is, particularly among male queers, that the rates of, of violence are very high. That is a left-wing paper. That is not the Australian Christian Lobby weekly newsletter saying that, okay? <laughs> If there, is, if there is an inordinately high rate of sexual violence within the homosexual community, do you think that could be one of the causes of inordinately high rates of depression? We also know that there are inordinately high rates of substance abuse. Could that be one of the causes too? A really sad 
a really sad fact is also, and there's research on this, that members of sexual minority groups and members of the queer community are actually far more likely to have experienced sexual abuse as children. This is the American Journal of Public Health, 2011. It says that sexual minority individuals are 3.8 times more likely to have experienced sexual abuse as children. Don't you think that might have something to do with depression and bad mental health in queer communities? The point that I'm making is, if you really care about mental health in these communities, you're going to dig down deep to try to find all the things that might be causing it. You're not just going to find the easiest possible answer, homophobia, and say, well, we've got to get rid of that, change the marriage laws. We've got to get rid of that. Uh, let's, let's, um, um, let's get rid of religious freedom. Boy, if you really care about this, you're going to look, you're going to ask the hard questions, and you're not going to shirk away from the hard answers. But I still want to talk about this question of, of Christianity and, and mental health. Um, does, do, do Christian ideas, do Christian doctrines of sexuality and sin, male, female, marriage, do they cause uh, mental health issues? Well, again, you know something, there is actually no good research that links Christianity and Christian ideas to general mental health concerns among the queer community. There's actually just no good research to that whatsoever. And so, you know, it's like we know that there are real mental health issues, issues among the queer community. There, is, there are issues of suicide. But in order to limit religious freedom and to limit the speech of Christians who might want to talk about these things from a biblical point of view, you've got to do a lot more than just say, oh, there are serious mental health issues in that community and there are serious suicide issues in that community. Stop them from saying these things. No, that's not enough. You've actually got to provide a link. You've actually got to provide a link. And I want to suggest to you that at the very least, no such link has been provided. And it may well be the case that in actual fact, no such link ever will be provided because no such link exists. So here's something that's interesting. A study that came out uh, a few years back in 2012, it studied a group of New Yorkers who, were, who identified as same-sex attracted uh, or bisexual. And these New Yorkers went to what we call sort of uh, non-queer affirming churches. And the, the, um, the scholars were expecting two things. They were expecting that, that queer people who went to these churches would have internalized homophobia, which simply means that they'll feel bad about the fact that they're same-sex attracted. And the second thing that they were expecting in their hypothesis was that this will also have ment ill mental health effects among these people. They carried out the study and they published it in a peer-reviewed journal and lo and behold, what did they find? Well, that they found that results did indeed support the general hypothesis that non-affirming religion was associated with higher internalized homophobia. So people who did go to these churches did actually uh, not affirm uh, the, the, the goodness of their same-sex attraction. But what they also found was that this had no effect, no negative effect on their mental health. Now, that's a peer-reviewed study. And so, again, the suggestion that religious ideas and Christian ideas are causing bad mental health, it's highly contentious. It's highly contentious. And there's another interesting thing that, again, scholars talk about. Uh, it's known as sort of the Dutch paradox. 
It's, it's kind of like if Christian ideas, if a really homophobic society, uh, if, if you find yourself as an individual member of the queer community in a, in a highly Christian society or a highly homophobic society, then you're going to have really bad mental health issues and it's going to be caused by these things. And you kind of think, well, maybe then if you remove these things, mental health issues will improve. And that would kind of be evidence that these things are causing harm, right? But that brings us to what scholars call the Dutch paradox. And it doesn't just go for the Netherlands, it goes for other countries, where in the Netherlands you have incredibly liberal laws about homosexuality, you've got same-sex marriage, and you're certainly dealing with a country that seemed far more quickly and, and, and just more, more deeply than others to have thrown away their Christian heritage. I mean, you know, the Netherlands, Amsterdam, they're, they're basically bywords now for libertinism, drugs, and, and all sorts of things. So whenever someone says, oh, I'm going to Amsterdam for a holiday, you're like, oh, okay. You know, I mean, <laughs> these are, it, you know, these, it is not noted as a very conservative society anymore. Am I right? And so then wouldn't you think that mental health issues among homosexuals would be much better? But in actual fact, they are not. They are not. That homosexual men in the Netherlands still have inordinately high um, degrees of mental health issues. So this all really calls into question this idea that a sort of homophobia is causing all the mental health issues and, 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 and suicide issues faced in queer communities, and B, it's really calling into question any causal link between Christianity and the, the bad mental health issues faced by members of queer communities. And so again, you know, don't be silenced when people say, oh, you've got to stop saying these things, we can't have these things public because issues within the queer community. You know something, the link between Christianity and harmful states of affairs for those in the queer community is far from obvious. It is far from obvious. But here's something else. If you are really concerned with mental health, again, if you really care about the mental health of people in the LGBTQ or the queer community, again, won't you be very careful not to advocate for policy that will actually be detrimental to ideas and institutions and practices that, has, that have proven themselves actually to be good for people's mental health. Doesn't that make sense? And then what if I told you that there is a mountain of research that indicates that religion and Christianity in particular is actually really, really good for people's mental health. Well, you know something there is. There's a ton of literature to that effect published in all sorts of pe recognized peer-reviewed journals. So in this particular one, American Psychologist, published in 2003, basically arguing that there is a positive link between church going and and good states of physical and mental health. There's a positive link. You know, you go to church, you are part of a community, this is all really good, both for your mental health and for your physical health. American Journal of Public Health again, 1997. Frequent attendance at religious services and mortality over 28 years. So the scholars studied people over a 28 year period to find out whether being a practicing Christian has any effect whatsoever on their physical health. And what did they find? That in actual fact, it has a really positive impact on their physical health. And this then goes on to have a positive impact, obviously, on their mental health. 
on their mental health. Again, you know, if you really care about the question of mental health, if you really care about the question of suicide, you are not going to want to advocate legislation or policies that actually militate against the very institutions and ideas that are proving to be really good for people's mental health. Here's something from a recent book on, on religion and medicine. The author of this particular, now this is a book published by Oxford University Press, gold standard, university publisher. The author, I believe, is a Harvard University academic. And what does he write about the relationship between Christianity and mental and physical health? He says, religious participation contributes to physical and mental health and subjective well-being. So just feeling good about yourself. Through shaping behavior, creating systems of meaning, altering one's outlook on life, building community and social support, supporting moral beliefs, and through the experience of the transcendent, through the experience of God. The writer goes on to say, a religious understanding of health, illness and well-being and of the actions needed to promote health will often make appeal to theological concepts such as sin, salvation, character, love, divine action and forgiveness. The point is what this scholar is saying is that far from being an agent to the detriment of mental and physical health, in actual fact, Christian ideas, even the idea of sin, is actually something that uplifts people. It's actually something that uplifts them. So is Christianity harmful? Not on your life. Not on your life. But you know, there are implications for all of this on this whole church-state debate that we're having nowadays. The whole question of religious freedom, not just in Australia with the anti-discrimination deal, but all around the liberal democratic world. Because we've got to remember, for the most part, arguments in favor of limiting, or curtailing freedom of speech, freedom of religious speech, and freedom of religion tend to be based on the idea that these ideas are harmful. That they are harmful. Okay? Prove it. They can't. It's just an assertion. It is just an assertion. But this is actually really, really serious. Because, again, you, you know something? To go back to where I started, Australia, the United States, the UK, they are liberal democracies. Part of their very political identity is that they hold in a kind of awe freedom of religion, freedom of speech. And what that means is that you need really, really good reasons in a liberal democracy to want to limit these things or to not want to protect them. Really good reasons. But here's the thing, strong accusations are not reasons. Assertions, no matter how strongly asserted and with, no, matter how, with, 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 no matter how much feeling of a link between the words of preachers, the words of the Bible, the words of the average person on the street and mental health issues among members of the LGBTQ community, in themselves, they are not arguments. They are not justifications for limiting religious freedom. You have to actually have strong evidence for the link. In a liberal democracy that values religious freedom, that values freedom of speech, you need more than just assertions. You actually need evidence. And that's what we're lacking. In fact, it's getting so serious that even during the same-sex marriage debate, you remember people were even saying, we shouldn't even be having this debate. I mean, forget about the laws. You know, the laws themselves are, you know, the traditional marriage laws, yeah, they're causing people to, 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 to they're causing mental health issues among uh, queer communities. The debate itself is going to cause mental health issues. Look, guys, that is how dangerous this idea of linking Christianity to harm actually is. I mean, think about it. Once you link Christianity to harm, 
Once you link Christian doctrines and freedom of speech to the mental health issues of the gay community, it becomes almost imperative for the government to do something about that. That's really dangerous. And what people were basically saying was, we shouldn't even have a debate. There should be no debate because it's going to be harmful. That is really dangerous for any liberal democracy. And that's why we, we as individuals, Christian scholars, journalists, and churches, boy, this is the thing that we've got to be really thinking hard about for the next generation, because this is the argument we're going to have to deal with at every turn. What you are saying is causing kids to kill themselves. Boy, that is a powerful argument until you really look into it. And that's what we've got to be doing. And so, you know, this is actually really important for today, for, for, for uh, this day and age. And if the argument against a robust protection of religious liberty in Australia and elsewhere in the liberal democratic world is essentially that people are going to say things that are detrimental to the mental health of the LGBTQ community, then guess what? That's a bad argument. And if that's the main argument, then there's no good argument against enshrining religious liberty with strong legal protections. I want to talk about this very briefly. I'm nearly finished. I want to talk about this from a, a slightly different point of view. This is not just a political issue. This is not just an issue of legislation. You know, university years, they were the best years of my life. I loved university. I'm very happily married, but my university years, they were great years. Um, <laughs> University is a great experience, but you know, at university, there are also a lot of ideas that you're going to hear at university that can really shake you. And one of the ideas that you're going to hear is that Christianity is harmful. Now, I've just tried to spend the last 40 minutes really just trying to disassemble that argument and expose it for the, the weak argument that I think it is. Would you like your children, your grandchildren, your niece or your nephew to be able to do that? I reckon you would. And you know something, the Australian Christian Lobby and the Lachlan Macquarie Institute, we offer courses that will train your children, train your grandchildren, train your nieces and nephews. And if you're you know, here between the age of, if you're here of university age, we can train you. So many people are going to university nowadays, they're coming out with their faith in tatters. Faith in tatters. Because they don't know what to expect in university. And they get hit with all these ideas by, you know, really brilliant people. By really brilliant people. And they're kind of just, they just feel defenseless. And they sort of just think, well, I've got no nothing to say back. And sadly, a lot of them finish university no longer Christians and often believing a whole bunch of really pernicious ideas, to be honest. We've got this course called GPS, like a, like a compass in your car, GPS. And over eight days with this course, uh, we will offer about four lectures a day training you, those between the eight, ages of 18 and 25, what to expect when you come to university We'll discuss the ideas that you'll hear, and we'll train you kind of in the nature of the secular slash, paradoxically, pagan age in which we live. We'll train you about where it came from, how does it operate, and how can we live as effective Christians within it. For eight days, we'll give you lectures by some of Australia's best Christian thinkers. It's, a, it's like a live-in camp. And you'll be there with dozens of other young Christians, all there to do the same thing, to learn about the world in which we live and just to really be able to prepare ourselves to go into it and remain a, a strong and rational faith in Christianity and do really good things. 
again, if, if you're a parent or if you're a grandparent, I'm, I'm asking you right now, think about turning or, or think about going to your, your children who are between 18 and 25 and say, look, I can't remember how much this thing is, about seven or 800 bucks for eight days. I mean, it's an incredible deal. It's all accommodation, all food, all lectures, transport to and from the airport. It's, it's at Murray and Bateman near Canberra. It's seven or eight, I think it's 700 bucks. It's a, it's a deal of a lifetime. I want some of you, I want all of you to say to your kids or your grandkids, I'll pay for this. You fill out the registration form, I'll pay for it because this is worth the investment. There's a lot of worse things that you've paid for for them. You know. <laughs> This one's really good. And if you like the sounds of that, we've got another course, and it goes for three months. Um, f first, the GPS course. We've got one coming up, that first eight-day one. We've got one coming up July 19th to the uh, uh, 26th of July. There are leaflets out the back that'll tell you more about it. I'd love to see a lot of you there. But we've got another one which goes for three months, and that's about training people for public leadership. It's a three-month live-in course. Uh, there are no real age restrictions for that one. It would be good if you had a university degree because it's going to be intense, a lot, of, a lot of reading, a lot of discussion. And that's to prepare Christian leaders to go out into whatever sphere you want to go out in and do really good things for Christ. If you want to go into the sphere of business, we'd love to train you. The media, we'd love to train you. Education, we'd love to train you. Politics, and we'll plug you into a network of established leaders who help you on your journey to be a servant Christian leader. You know, like I said somewhere else that, you know, there are all sorts of things going on in modern culture that people are becoming increasingly uncomfortable with. Like we're recently seeing things like drag queen story time and other really weird stuff. The, the whole transgender ideology movement. People are going to start asking, why is this happening? Where did we go wrong? At some point, someone is going to have an answer. And it's going to convince a lot of people. And that's going to set culture on a new path. We want to be the ones who give them that answer. We want to be the ones who have the most compelling response. Yeah. Where did we go wrong? Of course, we abandoned God. We abandoned the worship of God for the worship of ourselves. And our programs with the ACL and the Lachlan Macquarie Institute seek to train you to do just that. To be there at that moment when culture is crying out for answers and to be the one to give it to them. We've got to be ready for this moment when it comes. Get ready for it, because it is coming. Thanks for your time.